My name is Mary Norton. Today's date is June the 17th, 2014. I'm at the Roselawn Museum in Cartersville, Georgia, interviewing Mary John Battles about the life of Rebecca Latimer Felton. Mary John, talk about your personal connection to Rebecca Latimer Felton and why you're so passionate about telling her story. My aunt, Ann Collins, was Rebecca's great-granddaughter. And when I was a little girl, uh, they would bring out all of her papers, her things, many of these things in the museum, and they would display them on the front porch of their house. And people could drive by, look at those things, and people who were on vacation, driving up 41 would stop. And I was just mesmerized by all of her things. You know, uh, the spoons, the clothing. So I just became very interested in her. And then l later I began to, to listen to the stories about her. So uh, I think she was a great lady. And uh, I was just really fascinated by did what she, she did. Did she do this every summer? I mean, did people every get used? Su every summer um, they would put these, these out on the front porch and they would place them all on tables and they would label things and... Um, you know, same, pe same people came back, some new people came through, and they would look, and I was just fascinated by it. By that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rebecca was born in 1835 in Decatur, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Help us understand her early life, especially the influence of her parents and their strong value for education and her love of music. Her father was a, a, a planter, which was the upper class of that time. And that was a period of time of which uh, only the boy children were educated, but her father just went beyond that and made sure that both Rebecca and Mary were well educated, well informed, and were able to think for themselves. Uh, Rebecca may have been a woman, but she thought like a man. She did. She did that. And um, he, he was real passionate about that, but it wasn't just you know, learn to have parlor manners, uh, to be an interesting hostess. He went beyond that into uh, make, making them appreciate the arts, the theater, the music. She, she played the piano, she played the guitar, and she played the cello. And she loved to dance. And surprisingly enough, though, when she went to the Madison County College, they did not allow dancing, and she was just heartbroken. But her dad told her that he, she could put aside her dancing shoes until she was educated. He could train her. What she was the could, comment? She could, she could educate her. What was that song? She could there educate her mind and her feet later. Her I think feet something later. on that along that line that she oh. could be educated. But the she never lost that love of music. She passed that to her children as well. She married Dr. William Felton in 1853 when she was only 18 years old. Describe how she met Dr. Felton and the early years of their marriage and how they came back to Cass County or Bartow County. Mm -hmm. Dr. Felton uh, had by that time acquired, acquired the farm, uh, which is now right above the Cloverleaf intersection. And, but he was uh, a doctor and a minister and a teacher. And he was the guest speaker at her college graduation. She was valedictorian, gave the address, but of all the things that she, she kept, she did not keep a copy of that address. But uh, she, she met Dr. Felton there, and it was rumored to be love at the first sight because one year later they were married and went back to the home in Bartow County. And that's where they started their life and, and lived all of their life was in that, in that home in Bartow County. Talk about how the Civil War impacted this family. The Civil War was absolutely dev devastating to that family because um, h here they were, they were, you know, the economy was a slave-based economy. Um, you're having workers there, and all of a sudden we're, we're, our nation is thrust into a war. Everything that she knew, had grown up with, everything she was doing now, was going to be torn to shreds, you know. And can you just imagine that you wake up one morning and say, you've got to pack up and leave because an army troop is coming. You know, and that, that's what she had to do. They fled south to Macon. They lived there. And she wrote that, you know, she fled Bartow County. 
to Macon, only to meet Sherman again in Macon. And she got up one morning to cook breakfast and her yard was full of Union soldiers. And not only did they destroy her home here in Cartersville, but they stripped all the things out of the house in Macon, the farm in Macon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she started over really twice, lost two of her boys in Macon from uh, diseases. There was, uh, which had to be very hard for Dr. Felton, being a doctor and not being able to save your own children. So they're losing their children. And then they come home to Bartow County and their house is just, uh, was used for headquarters. Uh, as you well know, they did not have any respect for the furniture. And she said that when she turned in the driveway, there was her beautiful pram that she had pushed her babies in and it was just destroyed. I think it had a profound effect on her. You know, that um, very much like Scarlett, she didn't want to be without food, she didn't want to be without money and she was just not gonna, gonna be beaten in that aspect. But it did affect her for the rest of her life. What, what do you think motivated Dr. Felton to run for political office in, I think you said 1874? 1874, a period of time where Georgia is going through construct, reconstruction, the carpetbaggers are here, the taxes are outrageous, and uh, there's nobody to work the farm. Uh, she realizes that they are going to have to get along with the carpetbaggers. And at that particular time, uh, it was a very corrupt government. People were not getting a fair shake. Uh, Dr. Felton was a respected man in the community. And she felt like that in order to be able to survive, there was going to have to be change in the government. And she saw him as... The change agent. The change agent for that government. And, you know, so she encouraged him. Um, she might have pushed him a little bit. You know, um, we really don't know what her thoughts were, but she was not going to sit on the sidelines when he did run. She was there. But I think it was all for change and survival in the new government that was here. Actually, that leads into my next question because mm -hmm. I would be interested in hear, have, hearing you describe her involvement in her husband's political career. Well, you know, when, when you started to run, you had a lot of opponents. Uh, she was a very meticulous and, and wonderful writer. And she wrote newspaper articles, uh, comments. A lot of them were signed, a lot of them were not signed. She sent them in anonymously, but she wrote his campaign speeches. She became his campaign manager. Partly due to expenditures, they could not hire somebody to do that. I think she did it to protect him. She was not going to leave him in the, the hands of somebody that might shed a bad light on him, would be unfavorable to him, and could sometimes construe his thoughts, and she was not going to let that happen. She was going to, if they were going to run, they were going to be true to their, their political thoughts and their ideas and their values. You know, um, <clears throat> when, they, when they went to Washington, they arrived. Of course, they had to let, stay in a hotel. She, when she looked out, most every congressman there had their own political aid. They couldn't afford a political aid. So she became his political aid. She looked at every bill. She drafted his bills that he would come home. He would tell her the idea. She would draft them. She studied everything that went on in that, that legislature. She was privy to all of it. She was also cultivating her social circle at that time, you know, because a whisper here, a comment there to a wife always ended up in, at home over the dinner table of, the, of her husband. You know. And so she cultivated that. She was, she was there, and she, she was genuinely interested in, in that. How did, how did Bartow County perceive her it, it when... Because I thought I read something, they, they were getting two representatives for one. Right. Did you hear that? I did hear that. Um, yes, they did. Or sometimes they would say, who's the real candidate here? You know, and, but as she, she was right there with Dr. Felton. And I think that she was well-received. She was either well-received or not liked at all. 
and my school of thought is the people who didn't like her was because they couldn't be her. You know, most of the time we don't like people that we think can outdo us. Mm -hmm. Well, she could outdo most of the counterparts mm -hmm. that were that were running against Dr. Felton. Talk about how Dr. Felton's retirement launched Rebecca's public career in Georgia politics, and would the local community have elected her uh, if she decided to run for public office? Well, uh, when you know Dr. Felton became very ill, and and she her number one priority, of course, was his health, but she kept in contact with all of those political wives, all of those political people that he encountered, the people he worked with in Washington, she never let that go. She sent them cards, she wrote them letters, she kept her hand in politics. And she knew if there was ever gonna be change, that she would ha they would have to keep their hand in. I, I think that the public would have, have elected her, it was just that it had never been done before, a, a woman, because when she was appointed to fill the seat, Mm -hmm. you know, by, by Thomas Watson, and for Thomas Watson's seat, they had this enormous gathering at the courthouse, and she was so afraid that nobody was going to want to come because it was cold and rainy. But they came by the hundreds, and they cheered when she accepted the appointment. That's great. Uh, mm -hmm. That's great. It was interesting to read that Rebecca was an advocate for providing women's educational opportunities, and yet I also read she had strong feelings about the state funding public education. Could you discuss this dual position and how it evolved in her life? Well, you know, she was educated privately until she went to the Madison Female College, and, and she felt that, it was re that she was responsible for educating her own children. I believe that, she, that her thoughts were that if we gave our children to a public school, that we would lose somehow our process of knowing what they needed to learn, how they needed to learn, and the fact that you lost your responsibility. And she did comment that if we continued to allow Public, edu public education to teach our children that we would there would come a day when there would not be enough funding. I think the day is here. Oh. Uh, my husband Paul has been in the legislature for six years. Every year that budget increases and the majority of the state budget is for public education funding. But at last year it was somewhere around 57, 58 percent of the budget and yet we're still not meeting the needs of her children. Mm -hmm. um, the, so she saw that parent she saw parental that, responsibility. She did see that parental responsibility, and uh, you know, and she even she even said it's not, it's not the government's place to raise my children. It's not the government's place to educate my children. That is my responsibility. And she she was very adamant about that. But she was adamant about educating all children not just the male children, but the female children as, as well. well. Talk about the role of Senator Thomas Watson and Governor Thomas Hardwick's role in Rebecca's appointment to serve as the first woman in the United States Senate. Thomas Watson was a very good friend of Dr. Felton's. They had worked together before. Um, the, the Governor uh, Thomas Hardwick was also a very good friend. And Hardwick's first choice was not Rebecca Latimer Felton. Mm. It was Thomas Watson's wife, Georgia. But Georgia was in an ill health herself and declined, so his second nomination was Rebecca Felton. Uh, he wanted, he or he had to fill that position. He had to appoint somebody because the term was unex, you know, unexpired mm -hmm. and he had to fill that. He had a dual purpose for filling that. One was that he wanted to put in place somebody that could be beatable the next election. He had lost his bid, second bid for governor, so he was a lame duck governor. He wanted the Senate seat himself. Huh. And he thought if he put somebody in there that would not pursue that seat, he would have a better chance at it. And why not put a woman in there because a woman's never been there. And he honestly thought that she was just going to accept the role 
at the little cer the ceremony at the Bartow County court Courthouse and then go home and sit. Well, you, as we know, Rebecca was not going to let that pass. And uh, so when she wanted to s fill that seat and actually go to Washington, then all of a sudden we've got, mm, what are we going to do with her? George Wa uh, um, Wallace George, I believe that was his name. No, Walter George won the Senate seat. And he was inclined to let her sit before he took his seat in Washington. Now we have a conf conflict. Is it legal on opening day? We've got a newly elected senator. Can, can we let this senator sit before the really the elected one goes? So now we have a, a, a legal dilemma, and I'll, uh, what are we going to do about it? So Rebecca's not going to let that go. She writes the president. Oh, she does. She writes the president, President Harding, and asks him if he could not convene a, a call session of the legislature. And he does that. Now, he's a very smart man because he does that. He doesn't tell Congress why he's calling a special legislature you know, into session. He just says, we have legislation that needs to be passed. He calls it into session. Therefore, it is off of president, the president's desk. Now we've come down to it. Article 17 said, oh, we're going to argue this. It's illegal. You know, um, George says, I'm inclined to let her sit. You know, so here the newly elected senator, he's for her. Which senator in the Senate is going to stand up and say, no, we're not going to let her sit? I mean, that's political suicide. Yes. And so she really boxed them in. They had to either let her sit and be sworn in or risk political suicide for them. Yeah. She was very smart, very uh, strategic. Very strategic. Very yeah. strategic in her in her doing that, you know. Um, I did did hear the story that she sat outside. She was the first to arrive in the Senate on the day that they were to, to open. Uh, she sat outside. She had written two speeches, one, the acceptance speech, one uh, was kind of fiery on why they wouldn't seat her, but she sat there very patiently. She was not going to give up, and she sat there, and finally, you know, the sergeant of arms called and said, we'll hear Rebecca's, her uh, papers, her uh, appointment, mm -hmm. and she went, and then she also, they thought she was just going to cheer, you know, clap, and she was going to sit down. Oh, no, she goes to that podium. She's not, you know, this is her opportunity. And I like what she said, because she said, she addressed the president and said, uh, when women come to sit with you, they will bring, bring integrity to the office. Yes, wonderful. It was, it's profound words. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was curious about her friendship with two other fellow Jordans, Cora Harris and Martha Mitchell. Well, um, I I'm sure that her friendship came with Cora Harris through both being married to ministers. Both were circuit rider ministers. They were both Methodist ministers, so uh, they knew each other. Uh, Dr. Felton's ministry was probably a little more widespread. Cor Harris's course, her life was had a lot of tragedy in it, and um, her husband commit suicide. So, but they became friends through the Methodist aspect, mm. the, the the circuit itself was there, and both probably had a lot in common because they were both writers. I mean, Cor Harris was a fabulous writer. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's how that. Uh, as far as Margaret Mitchell, yes. Uh, the more I've, I've read the book of, on, and, and listened to the stories, the, the character of Gone with the Wind was based on Rebecca's life. She, was, she came home to a devastated plantation, just, just like Scarlet. She's not, you know, they had no food, but she was not going to let her family starve. She had to do business with the Yankees, and she was going to beat them at their own game, and she did because she opened a school and then charged all the Yankees tuition to, to educate their children here. At the school? Yes, Felton Academy is the one that she opened. Um, did not really charge that much of a tuition for local 
families, you know. But you know, when they when when the Reconstruction government came south and they brought the people in from the north, um, they had to have housing, and we know that they raised the taxes to just like in Gone with the Wind. And so she had to pay the, the taxes, but she said, well, and they began to think, well, where do, where do these children go to school? And she thought, hmm, I will beat them at their own game. I'll, I'll educate their children. And that's what she did. Yeah, but uh, so much of Gone with, the, Gone with the Wind. Margaret Mitchell actually came to the house and interviewed Rebecca before she wrote the book. She stayed overnight in, with Rebecca. And but the story about the the curtains, the is, curtains that, is that real? Yeah, yeah, that is real. That is real. Um, in the in the movie, when you know Car Scarlett jerks the curtains off the wall to make the the dress, the green velvet dress, um, there was you know clothing was at a premium when they came home. She had no no clothing, no material, could not afford material. So uh, the Yankees had not destroyed the drapes, and she took her drapes down and and made her a dress to wear. I imagine she wore that dress a lot on that campaign trail. And that dress is here at The Rose dress is here and in, in, it's out in the hall in, in Roselawn Museum. Are there other things that you can describe that are here at Roselawn that have special meaning for you? The, the little saddle trunk back there that was made on the Felton farm actually belonged to Captain John Felton. Um, but it was made by the slaves. And interesting enough, I, I do wish that they would open that trunk because it's lined with a newspaper about the War of 1812. Wow. Yeah. It's, and that, that little saddle trunk was for short trips. You strapped it on the back of your saddle. It, it would carry your papers or overnight clothing or of that sort. So it was called the saddle trunk. Now, it's made out of leather, you know, fashioned by the, the slaves. I loved it. I love her clothes. She was such a tiny woman, but very fashionable. Kept up with the you know, I, I imagine that she she felt that she was a reflection of her husband, and that sometimes uh, politicians might not meet Dr. Felton, but they might meet her. She had to make that first impression, mm -hmm. you know. and very conscious of a very conscious of first know. impressions. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. are there any musical instruments that belong to her that are here? At yeah, Rosa? the the piano downstairs um, that she that she learned it was a gift of, from her father. And um, surprisingly enough, I don't know what she she did to preserve preserve that, but it was not destroyed during the war. Her guitar and the cello, and the cello since passed out of the family, but the guitar is here. And she was very musical. She enjoyed that. She sang to her children. And of course, we know that she had five children and lost four. And Howard was the only one to survive, but he was born after he was the Civil War. He was born in 1867, okay. so he survived. The other thing that Rosalind does not have, I wish they did, was the spoons, the silver. Her father had given her a set of engraved um, silverware. It had Rebecca Latimer Felton, her initials on it. They were made from what was called coin silver, meaning that they could have melted it down and used them for money. She had a set of these and uh, felt, you know, at the last minute fleeing from Sherman did not know what to take, but she didn't want that silver to be lost. She puts it in a burlap bag and throws it down the well. Wow. And the, when she comes back... It's still there? It's still there. <clears throat> um, the spoons are dented where she, you know, when they hit the side of the, the well yeah. going down, but... Yeah, a lot of the pieces were gone. I'm I'm sure that at some point in time she had to melt that down for money, so there was very few pieces that remained in the family. Do you still do you have any of the pieces? <clears throat> I donated some to most of them to um, the history center. I did keep some and gave those to my children. Your children? Yeah, because they you know they need that. When you think about women leaders active in today's political arena, who is the person? that reminds you most of Rebecca Felton? And talk about some of the qualities you see in this person that exemplifies well, Rebecca. Well, and today, uh, I, I, let me back up and say, I always thought that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt had a lot of the qualities of Rebecca because she was out there doing things for her husband. And I think that, that she's an overlooked lady. It's, in today's... Um, 
you know, the, the world is so open, and we're, there's so many great women in politics now. Uh, for instance, the, the lady that sits behind Paul in the legislature, her name is Amy Carter. <laughs> it's no kin to, to Jason or, or President Carter. But um, she teaches school, and, and yet she serves in the legislature. And, and I, I think that's, that's a wonderful combination that she's there. She comes to mind. Um, I'm not a big fan of Nancy Pelosi, but she comes to mind. But there's just people, people out there that, that would never have had the opportunity had not Rebecca Fe Latimer Felton moved forward. What about Barbara Bush? Oh, Barbara, yes, Barbara Bush is, uh, is one. Because Barbara Bush was one of the few ladies that, I'll, that President's wives, uh, she and Bess Truman were, were Barbara and, and Bess, wherever they went. Mm -hmm. You know, they uh, they were an extension of their husband, yet they were independent of their uh, their husband. Um, I, I liked her. I like Barbara Bush a lot. Mm -hmm. When you think about the life of Rebecca Felton, discuss what you see as her greatest contributions, and how do you want future generations to remember her? You know, it, she did so much. The education was really was the top priority for her. She fought for education in, you know, um, she she served on the the board of um, to help get Georgia established. A lot of people don't know that, but she she did that. Um, she fought against the inhumane treatment of convict labor. Hmm. She was and women's suffrage. Now, she also started a campaign in 1915 for equal pay for equal work. Well, wow. we don't give we don't give her credit for that, but you know, uh, she owned and operated a newspaper. She wrote for the Atlanta Journal. How many years did she do that? Her years after Dr. Felton did. Uh, she she was a cross between uh, Dear Abby and Hints from Eloise. She also had uh, wrote. Newspaper articles called "Timely Talks with Miss Felton." Yeah, so Lord only knows what was in those timely talks, but uh, she did give advice. Um, I, I think that that her her passion for women to excel in their own right, you know, for her to to be that because um, it wasn't till you know women's suffrage really came after Susan B. Anthony started that, that she got on the bandwagon. And actually her sister Mary McClendon was very much into that more than Rebecca was. But, you know, Rebecca was the more notable of the two. So, yeah. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to make sure is reflected in, in our talk, discussion I, I, today? You know, what I want, and, and, and it's so sad, because our history books do not do her justice. If you open any type of history book now, it's just a small blip in there that she was there. I, I would like for us to do more, um, honor her more, mm -hmm. you know. But I think what I would really want people to remember about her was that she was not afraid to give up. In the, in the face of every hardship she there, she could not be beaten. She would not give up. Thank her for, you know, we can thank her for that. Yes. Or we would not have a place in, women would not have a place in political life without her. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing your stories well, about Rebecca with us I've enjoyed with us being today. here. Thank uh, you. I really, um, I really enjoy talking about her. I think she's a very noteworthy person. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.